coming. Um, so our presentation today is by Dr. Donna Jurdy, um, and this is the fourth um, presentation in our series of lectures um, that is sponsored by the Title V STEM grant. <coughs> and um, just a little bit about Dr. Jurdy. Um, she is a professor of Earth and Planetary <coughs> Sciences at Northwestern <coughs> University. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester, her master's from the State University of New York at Buffalo, her PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, her research interests include hot spots, plate kinematics, reference frames, and plate dynamics on Earth, as well as the magnetization of Mars and the tectonic activity of Venus, Mars, and satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. She is active in the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, as well as the Society for Exploration Geophysicists. Um, in addition, she serves on the board of directors for the Association of Women Geoscientists and was awarded their Distinguished Service Award for starting and funding their Speakers Bureau. Uh, professor Drudy was named a visiting professor for the Graduate University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing and has taught there. Um, this afternoon, she's going to be talking to us about Mars. And I just wanted to remind everybody that she will also be giving a presentation in Carson Auditorium tonight at 7 p.m. Um, about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So please help me welcome Dr. Jody. Mars, uh, the history of exploration there, uh, begins um, not with science so much, but really with political. Um, here's President Kennedy in his address, um, and he is saying we, we choose to s explore in space and go to the moon because it is, is difficult. And at the Smithsonian um, Air and Space Museum, they have his speech running full time, and he's telling Congress this will not be cheap. It all started in 1957, which was the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, when the Russians put up Sputnik, and everything changed in the US. Science became a priority, and it changed my life. There were scholarships and fellowships and opportunities for research for everybody, anybody who could do it. Um, Mars, though, the interest in Mars goes back, way back, and uh, here you see Percival Lowell, and he is at his 24-inch refractor in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, Percival didn't have to worry about getting funded. He funded it himself and built his, his own um, observatory. And it's a wonderful place to go visit. For my money, it is the best science tour in the country. It's really good. And this is where Pluto was discovered, the once planet now demoted to a dwarf planet, Pluto. Anyway, um, at the time, Percival Lowell um, drew did this drawing of what he saw with Mars. And um, people saw dark areas, like this one here, and lighter areas, and thought they saw canals. And this goes back to 1877. There was a very close opposition of Mars with Earth. So the distance was about the least it, it can be. And an Italian astronomer, Schiaparelli, identified in Italian, he called them canali. OK, that's Italian. In Italian, canali, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, means channels. And channels doesn't necessarily mean made by intelligence. It, it could be a geological phenomenon. But translated into English, it became canals. And people were thinking of the Suez Canal and were thinking of something made by intelligence. And so the view at the time was that uh, Mars could well be inhabited by intelligent beings. <coughs> um, the problem with viewing Mars is that you're viewing it through the atmosphere. And so that nice diagram that he drew, you have to see it and then you, you try to transfer it onto paper. Um, this is what it looks like through the atmosphere. Uh, you can see the polar cap, you can see some of the dark areas, and at least with a five inch refractor. Uh, you cannot see any any canals. Um, this opposition in 2003 was the closest that Mars was since biblical time. Very, very close. 
So if you missed it, it's gone. <laughs> um, okay. Mars is a source of, is a planet of intelligent life. Um, this, this goes way back in history, and this is H.G. Wells' um, work, The War of the Worlds. I don't know if any of you have read this. It very much takes place in the UK, a lot of little hamlets that you've never heard of, and finally the, the aliens get to, um, to London. Now, this is by H.G. Wells. Orson Wells, with an E, did this on the Mercury Theater in 1938 as sort of a, a first-hand um, account. And people related to that and thought that the Earth was being attacked by Martians. And in fact, a little personal thing about the Martians, um, in New Jersey, they landed in Orson Welles' account in Grover's Mills, New Jersey. And I was at Princeton for a number of years, and the chairman of the geology department there, when he was a cub reporter in 1938, was sent down to, to cover for the Daily Princetonian the landing of the Martians. <laughs> anyway, no Martians. Um, Mars is often covered by huge dust storms. Now this is a picture taken with Hubble. Now Hubble doesn't have to view it through the Earth's atmosphere, so you get a much better picture. But this um, dust storm is, is interesting because it reminds me to say that missions to Mars are fraught with problems, and the statistics are that one out of three is a success. Um, the poor Russians landed a their, their second lander on Mars, called Mars 3, um, in 1971, and it was programmed, pre-programmed, to take pictures for three months. It was the middle of a dust storm. So it took pictures for three months and not nothing. But Mars is a very, very difficult place. Okay, Mars has its... Um, conspiracies, and this is the face on Mars, and this was taken by the Viking uh, probe, which I'll show you, and it, gee, it really does look like a face, and some of these things really do look like pyramids, and it started a whole uh, conspiracy thing about Mars, this is the movie Mission to Mars, but when we went back with higher resolution, the face disappeared. Okay, so it, it is really a face. And those who believe it's a conspiracy, though, will say that it's being covered up. So, so it, but higher resolution pictures do not show a face. Here's a happy face. That's not really a happy face. Now, Mars. Here, here's a comparison with the with the planets, the inner planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and, and Earth's moon is thrown in, and Mars. And um, Mars is uh, fairly dense, and something I learned, Mars is very small. Okay, Mars's radius is only 3,398 kilometers, and it was during the core movie. I don't know, has anyone seen the core movie? You don't need to. Okay, skip it. But in the core movie, the, the protagonist is, is, is testifying before, the, um, before Congress, and he says, Mars, uh, the core of the Earth, it's as big as Mars. And I stopped and I thought, oh my gosh, that's right. Mars is only as big as the Earth's core. And the reason for that, at least as we understand it now, is that as the solar system formed, poor little Mars being next to Jupiter, the way the solar system formed, it, it is thought that Jupiter coalesced in a thousand years. Jupiter, huge Jupiter, formed in a thousand years. Well, poor little Mars next door to Jupiter didn't have a chance to get the material. And so it, it's called often a dwarf planet. But that could be significant and that could be important. Uh, for those that study the history of life on Earth, having a little dwarf planet next door, small, with a low escape velocity, that cooled early, could be a place to get life going and then blast it to Earth so that when Earth is cooled down enough, you can get life going. So you can think of it as a, as a little nursery planet. Um, okay, here's the comparison with Earth. You see it's really very much smaller. But there are some eerie similarities to, to Earth and that people knew even back in the 1800s. Um, 
Amazingly, the length of day on Mars is, is 24 hours and 30 some minutes. That's amazing. It has ice caps, polar caps, just like, like the Earth. It seems to have seasons, and in fact, people interpreted the coming and going of dark areas as being vegetation. So the science fiction of the 50s, when they went to Mars and there were plants, that was, in that day, a possibility. Okay, they were carnivorous plants, which makes you wonder, what were they eating for the last three billion years? But anyway, um, so that's the size of, of, of Mars relative to Earth. And um, Mars is our candidate, the best candidate of the planets for, for life in, in the solar system. Now, back in the 60s, <coughs> we sent the Mariner missions to fly around Mars. And we had some, some bad luck. And we had some, some successes. But again, overall, one out of three is the success rate for Mars, even now. So things, things go wrong. And up to this time, people actually believed it was possible that, that Mars had vegetation on it. Well, the Mariner flew around and mapped the planet and found it was more moon-like. Uh, lots of craters. And here it is approaching, and you can already you can see the craters in it. Do you see any canals? <coughs> no. No, there were no canals. So that was, well, it was what it was. I, I saw um, a video of JPL when Mariner first approached Mars, <coughs> and it was just dead silence when they first started seeing all the craters. Just dead silence. So this was a surprise. And here's what Olympus Mons looks like, the biggest volcano in the solar system, as viewed from the Mariner, and the caldera. It's just, it, things are big on Mars. But there's some evidence for water on Mars. Um, there's some evidence that Mars had flowing water at its surface. Some of these patterns look like, um, look like water has flown around things. And the Viking landers actually saw frost forming and then evaporating. Now, up till now, um, in the late 60s, we only had um, orbiters going around Mars. So we don't really know what the atmosphere is like, what the pressure is at the surface. And that is going to take a lander to do that. This is more water, what, what these might be islands. And this is erosion that looks like water. And this almost, don't they look like river channels? I mean, they really do. It's not there now, but they sure do look like river channels. And um, something that I worked on are some of these debris aprons. Um, I've never seen on Earth a rock glacier. It's a pile of rubble <coughs> on top of a glacier. And that's what they think these things are on uh, on Mars that they're covered with rocks and underneath is ice. And what we did is to model the shape of these debris aprons and compare them to a plastic model. And we find that these debris aprons um, see, it could have 40% water inside. So these could be resources for future landing. So, but we don't see any water at the surface. And that was documented by the Viking um, missions. These are going to be landers. And once again, politics is coming in. 1976 was our bicentennial, and we wanted to do something big and splashy. And so we launched the Vikings. Now we launched two, because these Vikings, they were about as big as a golf, as a golf cart. You know, so they're not big. And they had to land someplace really smooth. And if they tilted by more than 18 or 20 degrees, it wouldn't work. So you couldn't land on a big, big um, boulder or anything. In fact, JPL thought 50-50 are chances of getting it to work, you know, realistically. And so let's do two. I, when I teach in Beijing, in Beijing, everything is um, the space program. If you ever see any press releases, you'll see generals with medals giving the talks. It's, it's very, it's, the military is running it. And everything is secret. Nobody knows what's going on. This one hears this. That one hears that. But I tell the students, when we have a launch, it's announced. We all know when it's going to be. You can go down and watch the launch yourself. 
We all know what equipment's going to be on the launch. We share in the success or we share in the failure. We all we televise our failures, right? Again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so here's the launch of Viking 2. And the plan was, it was a great plan for the bicentennial for July 4th, 1976, to have the Viking on, on the surface of Mars. Well, there were some problems with finding the right site. And they decided, look, this is so iffy. Better to, to miss the deadline or to miss the, the important day and, and get an area that's even smoother. And so here's the Viking landing. And here, this is a fake image. It's a composite. In other words, Viking took lots of individual pictures, and then it's put together into a composite. So you know, you would never see this. Um, but this is what the what it looks like, and you can see that what Viking saw. It saw this. Oops, I got to go back. Let's see if this works. This huge gash. This is this is as big as from LA to New York. Uh, it's a valley. In, in fact, those of you who are geology students, everything has been proposed. It's extensional, it's this, it's compressional. I, we, we don't actually know at this point. And this is a very dangerous place to put down a lander because it's, um, it goes down several kilometers. So you, you forget it for landing. Not, not going to happen. Um, but it's huge. We've got these huge volcanoes, and now we have this huge gash. This is what the Viking lander looked like. It was about as big as, um, as I said, golf court, golf cart, and it, it was really 60s technology, and all of the equipment had to share power with everything else. And um, I, it had a seismometer, and the seismometer was mounted on the leg of the lander. Now, anybody who knows anything about seismometers, normally we use the verb plant a seismometer. Because if you're looking for oil or you're putting seismometers out for, um, um, you know, to listen for earthquakes, you want it in contact with the surface of the ground, right? So this seismometer was put on the leg. It was not in contact with the surface. So this is not an optimal, or, and it had to share power with all the other instruments. So it wasn't running full time. And you will often hear that um, the seismometer didn't work. Not fair. There were two seismometers, one on Viking 2 and one on Viking 1. The Viking 1 seismometer, there's a cage that holds the seismometer in place so, so when you land it doesn't you know, disrupt it. Well, the cage didn't open. So they commonly say the seismometer didn't work. The seismometer didn't have the opportunity to work. Okay, but the Viking 2 seismometer did, did record things. Um, we really don't know if um, Mars is tectonically active or not because it, it is said, some seismologists have looked at this, say that if, that if a seismometer with those properties were put in the most seismically active region of, of the Earth, I mean, maybe one over one of the subducting plates, running part-time, mounted in the way this poor little seismometer was, there's only a 30% chance you'd record anything. Okay, so, so not fair to say that um, Mars, um, that Mars uh, isn't tectonically active. We do not know anything about the interior of Mars. We do not know if it has a liquid core. We do not know the size of the core. We do not know the thickness of the crust. Without seismometers, we don't know. And to this day, to this day, one seismometer has been put down on a planet besides it, <coughs> mounted on the leg of the, of the lander. So one of my goals, professional goals, is to try to get a seismic network on Mars. And it's just, it just takes, it takes forever to get anything, to get anything done. <laughs> Okay, so this is what Viking 2 saw. And boy, when you look at some of the sizes of these boulders, it's, um, I'm not sure what that is there in the picture. It's a lens cam, maybe? Something. But anyway, they, they know what it is, so they know the size. Um, it, it, this is what it looks like. It almost looks terrestrial. Um, but we are really lucky. If the lander landed on that one there, that, that would have been it. It would have been cocked by more than 20 degrees, and it just wouldn't have worked. <coughs> ah, life. 
one of the big things that Viking was supposed to do was to scoop up soil and to do an experiment for life. Now, the, all this has to be done remotely. Okay, obviously, an optimal experiment for life would be to have a sample, to bring it back, and to do different experiments in sequence based on what happened in each experiment. We can't do that. We have to do the experiment in situ, on location. So they scooped up some um, soil and heated it and added carbon-14 to see if it was taken up. And the results were ambiguous. And so they didn't announce announced that there was life. I've done some reading about this, and apparently the person who designed the experiment thought it, it indicated life. But he was the only one. And so you're all alone, and everybody else on that team doesn't think so. And as Carl Sagan said, if you're going to make extraordinary claims, and life on Mars is an extraordinary claim, you need extraordinary evidence. And it was just shaky. So, so it's ambiguous. We, we don't know for sure. I'm a geophysicist, so my word on this is not worth a lot. I personally feel that life may have started on Mars and then gotten a head start of a couple hundred million years and was delivered to Earth. Okay, that's my personal view. And the people who know a really lot about this think we might find life in existence on Mars in a, in a protected area somewhere, okay, right now. And if we do, the biochemists will know for sure if it's the same life star as Earth. And if it's the same life star as Earth, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And if it's a different life star, that's amazing. That means two adjacent planets started life. That's astounding. It means it's going to be everywhere, is how I interpret it. But so, I don't know, maybe we'll know, maybe you'll know in your lifetime. This is uh, some of the volcanism on Mars. This Olympus Mons, the highest and largest shield volcano in the solar system. And up there in the corner, it's comparing it to uh, Mauna Loa, okay, which, which seems to be big when you see it. But this is much bigger. So Mars has, we saw the huge volcanoes that Viking could see from the ground. Um, and they're absolutely huge. Another thing that Viking was able to do was to actually, or Olympus Mons, a postcard of Olympus Mons. Okay. Another thing that Viking was able to do, this is what our terrestrial shield volcanoes are like. And what we do on Mars is count the number of craters. And if you see a lava flow that's just punctured with craters, it's pretty old. If you see a lava flow with no craters, it's very young. So we can kind of get an idea. It's been active, not terribly recently, but mm, maybe 100 million years ago, which isn't bad. And the geology did this. Okay. And the geology did this. This is how big they are on Earth. Now, um, we actually have topography of Mars now. And this is what it looks like on a Mercator map. And Mars has a dichotomy. It's got southern highlands, and you can see all the craters, right? These are old. And what do you notice about the northern lowlands? <coughs> now, what this is, this is the color scheme that's been chosen so that blue is low and red is high, okay? So it's sort of psychologically, you're thinking water, right? Can you see the blue? So the, the northern hemisphere, and this is a dichotomy, um, might have been an ocean at one time. It doesn't, some of, don't some of these look like outflow channels? Another convincing thing, besides it being lower elevation, you can see how smooth it is. And it, you can just, these are called ghost craters. The craters are underneath there, but they're smoothed over, maybe by sediment. Um, so this is, we have to, really good topography of Mars now. Another strange feature, this is a huge um, plateau with a volcano on it, much bigger than anything on Earth and unlike anything anywhere else. And this is that Tharsis region with those big volcanoes, uh, Olympus Mons that I showed you. And do you see, don't those look like flood channels coming out of the, the northern lowlands? So this is very strange indeed. 
Indeed, this is the ocean that's been proposed in the north. Um, <coughs> Okay, so this is a geology of Mars that we figured out. Now, these are little globes superimposed on the topography. So, again, red is high and blue is, is the northern lowlands. <coughs> and you see the volcanoes. And you see that Valles Marinara is the thing that runs from New York to L.A. that's absolutely huge. So, Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system and the biggest, whatever this is, valley, you know. So... Um, you know, in, in the solar system. Um, probably, based on the number of craters, the southern highlands is two to three billion years old. Okay, lots of craters. And that's what they first saw with the Mariner, all those craters. And we're just, we're just shocked. Okay, so I think this is good because it shows us where Viking 1 landed and Viking 2. And don't forget, they were thinking, we're going to be lucky to get one of these to land. And it, what, what a bonanza to get both of them. And I'm going to be showing you the Pathfinder, the next, uh, the rover mission, um, next. And uh, we, can, we can see that. But before that, this is NASA's exploration program. And um, Mars Global Surveyor, MGS, I'll talk about. Um, Mars Express, I think, I thought that was uh, ESA. But, and then the Mars Exploration Rovers, we're going to be looking at those. So, and then um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've had some failures, too, where something, the Mars Observer didn't get to. Uh, so here's the Mars Global Surveyor lifting off in November uh, 1996, and that's what it looks like over there. Um, that's just a schematic. Obviously, nobody's there to take a picture at Mars, right? So this is sort of artist, uh, uh, artist things. Um, with the Voyager, um, with the Voyager mission, you know, the, the, still going on in the outer solar system, they almost didn't put a camera because they thought there would be nothing to see. It was just going to collect data. Oh, what a mistake that would have been because the pictures were so amazing. And the best pictures were when it looked back over its shoulder, the shoulder its metaphoric shoulder, to take to see what it saw. And that, those, were, those were really good. So here we have blast off in 1996. And then something absolutely amazing happened. Well, let me go back. First, something bad happened. And um, the bad thing that happened was that these solar panels didn't open appropriately. And they have to open in order to get the light from the sun to, to, to run things. And so what they did is they kept the orbiter in low orbit over Mars for a long time while they just kind of eased them open. And, you know, we're geophysicists. We measure things when we don't even know what we're measuring sometimes. And that's true about the magnetic patterns on Earth. For years, they measured the magnetic station of the ocean floor. Didn't have a clue what it was. So when somebody finally came up with a theory, all the data was there and they could pull it out. Okay, so they measured the magnetic um, measurements, the magnetization. Now, everybody knew Mars wasn't magnetized because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field now. The experiment was going to be to measure the magnetization of the upper atmosphere. But while they were waiting for those, those solar panels to, 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 to come into, look, into full spread, they measured. And lo and behold, we discovered something nobody, nobody predicted. Mars's crust was magnetized. It doesn't have a magnetic field now, but it is magnetized. And the southern, this is the, that's the dichotomy boundary that I showed you. Not much magnetization in the northern hemisphere, uh, but then the craters are kind of obscured up in the northern hemisphere too. And in the southern hemisphere, this is plotted with zero in the center, which was the convention for Mars, centered around 180. So it's unfortunate because it splits it and puts it each in one half. There's a lot of magnetic. Should we use the word lineations? I don't like using that word because I don't like anomalies. Because when you say magnetic anomalies, you are thinking ahead. You are thinking <coughs> of how Earth's magnetic, uh, magnetized ocean floor gets done with 
hot material in the center, symmetry on both sides with an alternating field. Okay, so we don't know that it, that it is there. Plate tectonics has been proposed for Mars. I'm going to go back, and we don't know how these were formed. I think it's unfortunate the way these are plotted on a Mercator projection because it pulls out the stuff near the pole and makes it look somewhat like lin magnetic lineations. And so this is um, something that I've worked on. I decided to look at the magnetization around 180, the strongest magnetization. And uh, let me go forward one more. So what I'm looking at here, this is my own research. This is 180. I'm putting 180 in the center. And um, the low data is in color. After they discovered with the Mars Global Surveyor that the crust was magnetized, they decided to map the whole crust. They redid the mission really quickly. So they spent a lot of time in low orbit to map the entire crust. And what we did is to look at the data around 180. Instead of working with spherical harmonics, we fit, we fit the, that region to a Cartesian uh, XY, simple thing to do, the magnetization, and then downward continue the magnetic field. Now this is what the geology looks like there. And now if I go back, we find by trying to fit this with um, dipoles that that um, strong dipoles occur in this in this region, and they occur right on the outer boundary of some of the big craters. So these are the dipole sources. So instead of fitting it with lineations, we say this one, this one, this one, this one. Oh, about, uh, I don't know, 12 or 14 dipoles fit 95% of the field. And those dipoles coincidentally tend to be on the outer reaches of very big craters. So I wonder if they're not magnetized at the time of um, impact. So we have a lot of disagreement about these magnetic patterns on, on Mars. And no one knows for sure. Some say that it's like seafloor spread, but most aren't convinced. I think it's related to magnetism, uh, igneous activity around craters, um, at least in the, in the southern hemisphere here. But what we do agree about is the magnetization is very ancient because any recent craters obliterated. So Mars doesn't have a magnetic field now, but it did then. And that's sort of consistent with a Mars that's very um, small. Its core is going to be small. And maybe it just has completely solidified. So it is not magnetic. It doesn't have a magnetic field at this point in time. How far back does the Earth's magnetic field go? I think we have measurements in the pre cambrian <coughs> Okay, so now we're off to some of the recent um, <coughs> some of the recent rovers. Um, for many people, the goal is to have human exploration of, of Mars. And back in 1969 and 1970, when we were landing on the moon, it seemed like almost every other day. It wasn't really. It was just five or six Apollo missions. Kids who were 10 and 12 thought, wow, I'm going to get to go to Mars. And then 50 years goes by, and <laughs> it's too late. It's for them, anyway. And the, I mean, the joke, the, the, the joke in China is, the, is that the first person on Mars will be a Chinese woman not born yet. And the key is not being born yet. Because if you're born, it's too late. Um, it's possible, people used to talk about 2020 for a land, uh, human mission. It's possible, but not 2020 probably. Um, one of the difficulties is um, the radiation there. One of the things Viking showed, it, the, the, the pressure is extremely low. The pressure is, is seven millibars compared to almost 1,000 millibars for Earth. Okay, so it's like, you know, one, less than 1%. And as the ice caps form, that pressure goes down even more as the um, volatiles are pulled into the ice caps, you know, for the seasons. So practically no pressure. Liquid water is not stable currently on Mars with that pressure and temperature, the phase relations for liquid water. 
so it just disappears. Um, any ice at the surface will just sublimate into the atmosphere. Okay, so you need, you need supplies, you need water, you need to get them there. Um, so one of the things we talk about with the students is how, how they feel about a one-way mission to Mars. <laughs> um, the American public, I don't think, would accept it, do you? No. But don't you think when people, people left for Jamestown from, from England, I mean, you gave away your stuff and you said goodbye to your friends, and it was a one-way trip, wasn't it? We don't even know what happened to them. So, you know, I think the uh, astronauts that went to the moon, they were, they were test pilots, and I think they, they understood the dangers. And I mean, most of them made it back. And, but, you know, we had, we had some disasters there, too. Anyway, but now we're working with rovers. And um, this is um, the Pathfinder site. Um, whoops, I see the date is wrong. It should be 1997. <laughs> see, politics, politics, politics. So July 4th, we got something big for the bicentennial. Um, and boy, you see how rocky it is. Now, the first Pathfinder was about the size uh, of uh, Sojourner, was about the size of a, of, of a golf cart. And it was only supposed to work for a week. And it's named after Sojourner Truth, who was a, a civil rights um, um, a leader. There's a stamp, I think, 18 cent or something with her on it. Um, and it works for, for several months, so that's really good. Um, and it does analysis of, it takes pictures of rocks, it can do some, some analysis. Now, they were able to measure the temperatures, and, and do note that these are Kelvin, okay? over here, so it's really cold, and you can see the daily temperature change at the surface, and it also measured the pressures, and that's in millibars, and there is, oh geez, it's all less than seven, isn't it? So it's, it's very low pressure. Now, but there is evidence that Mars might have had a thick atmosphere and flowing water. You saw some of that evidence uh, going back, back in its history, but right now, the temperatures are really, 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 and pressure's really, really low. So here's the little sojourner, and you see it's, I'm not sure where this picture is, I think this is a real, little tracks, it's looking at rocks, and you name the rocks. There's Yogi, that rock. Now that, that one there is uh, big. But what they found is that, first of all, most of the rocks were basalt. We know basalt, those of us who are earth scientists. Basalt is the ocean crust. Um, every now and then, something is a little richer in silica. Um, and there could be weathering. Some of the rocks had, had, um, were like ventifacts. Uh, those are things you find in the desert that have been eroded by wind. They have faces on them, so it indicates uh, lots of... Um, uh, activity with the dust storms. Um, so we learned some things from Pathfinder, but then we did some more. Uh... Oh, I don't remember that stamp. <laughs> I wonder if that was a priority rate. That, you know, not oh, right for 1977. I don't remember that. Okay, so here's here's an ancient uh, Martian shoreline. And when we landed the next um, pro, uh, next uh, rover, the idea was to be near this shoreline. And uh, up close, that again is the ocean we talked about. And Mars is, has dried out a lot. But before we move on to the next rover, this is uh, these are pictures taken by Mach, which is a Mach. Mars MGS, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Orbiting Camera. And it was there looking at this feature in 1999, and six years later, it flew over again, and you see the added thing. Now, what is this? One theory, and perhaps the best, is that this is flowing water that just, you know, just disappeared. Um, if it were a boulder or something that rolled down the slope, you'd expect to see the, the offender there. So this could be evidence of, of water action really recently. Some people think um, that there's a lot of water, you know, right below the subsurface. It would be stable at the temperatures and pressures in the 
in the surface. Do we have any science fiction fans? Red Mars, Green Mars, you read them? Kim Stanley Robinson? Okay, anyways, but the idea that it might be a lot of water in the subsurface of Mars, just, just below the surface. <coughs> Factors clouds. Okay, so here's the Mars Exploration Rover. Now this, is, they tell, say this is about as big as a moon rover. It's bigger. And it's got all kinds of instruments on it. And you see the wheels. And these things have run way beyond. But because they're so big, landing them was a, a different thing. They had to do this balloon thing to land them. And we, we talked to a woman who's on the, um, the rover uh, team, and she said she doesn't remember anything about the landing. She just, just went unconscious, you know, just waiting for the thing to land. She just does not remember anything about it. Okay, so there's the landing site for the opportunity. And there's the panorama of the crater that it, that it saw. And this is assembled from different pictures. So it's, it's a panorama. And there's the crater. Now, one of the things that they saw is um, these little blueberries. And they're, they're called blueberries, and they find them on Earth, too. They're little balls of hematite. And they indicate to a geologist that there was water there. Okay, so this is something we see on Earth, too. It's difficult when you see something you've just never seen. I mean, like Bailey's Marinara, it's just no idea what, what, what it is. It's spirit, and it there. All these sites are heavily um, discussed for years and debated. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to land on a very flat, safe place that's not screwed with rubble. But then you want to be near enough to be able to go to something really interesting. But maybe the interesting thing isn't exactly where you can land. So this Gusov crater, isn't that, look at that. Gosh, doesn't that look like an outflow thing from the crater? Um, this is where they landed. And that's what the, the rocks look like. It almost looks Earth-like. This is the curiosity. Oh, I hope I have the one with all the different uh, has too much going on. So here's the lander, the site, what the craters were. And for geology people, you, you see the bedding planes. There's cross bedding. And that indicates um, almost certainly water was in effect there. And in fact, when they analyze, one of the projects was to analyze um, cobbles and the shapes. And there's like two different groups. Some are really smooth. And then others are highly angular. So maybe the angular ones come from impacts and broken up stuff. And then the other round ones have been influenced by water action. Um, at least that's the, the current thinking. Now, these are all the instruments. Um, the, the woman who talked to us about this had something really interesting to say. She said they had to design it so that the, um, so that the um, where they were taking the pictures from, the cameras, were at about two meters. Because that's, that's how we view things. That's how our brains process material. When you take the pictures from dog level, you know, a foot above the ground, it's confusing and you can't, you can't, things don't look right. You can't sort it out. So it was important to have a camera so that you could process, mentally process the pictures. And um, they had all these other, these other things, a spectrometer to tell about the, um, <laughs> to tell about um, what elements were in there. They have a radiation sensor to tell about what the cosmic level is, a robot arm, a laser induced. Uh, but all this time we're looking at surface stuff. We're not getting below the surface. And that's something that is very much um, in need. We did have the Viking dig a little trench just millimeters down, and frost kind of accumulated there. So they have this, um, see they're zapping this and kind of looking at this, this, this rock. Um, and they have this laser-induced um, breakdown spectrometer. So they have six, six things, and six or eight or ten of these things all going at once. And, and one of the things um, the, the rover team person told us, somebody had designed an instrument that could actually get the age of, of the rocks 
in situ, but it was too big. And so what is the age of these things? Well, what they do is they look and say, okay, there's 1.5 meters of these sediments that are layered. If we assume that you lay down one meter every 100 years, you know, then it's 1,500 years. That's a big assumption. We, you know, who knows? So we don't know the ages of any of these things other than looking at the, at the craters. So this is good, leaving no stone unturned. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, Mars may have had an ocean. Um, the atmosphere was probably thicker. We see evidence of running water. Currently, it is, the pressure is so low, and at that temperature, water is not stable. So water is not stable at the surface. Um, we have found out that Mars may have had, it definitely had a magnetic field. Did it have plate tectonics? We're still debating on that. Um, perhaps three and a half billion years ago, um, Mars had, um, was a lot more like Earth, and that would have been when life, life might have existed on Mars. Um, in, in fact, for life, this is a picture of this is with a microscope. This is from the Allen Hills meteorite. Um, it might be a sample. We think it's a sample of Mars, okay? It's called ALH84001. So that means Allen Hills in, in Antarctica, 84 is the year, 001, the first one that anybody picked up. And the woman who picked it up said that she it just looked different, you know, when she picked it up. Well, when they looked under the microscope, there's this strange, this strange pattern here. Okay. These are, oh, I don't have a scale. These are very teensy. Is this evidence of life? No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, but we do have samples of Mars in terms of, in um, meteorites that are brought to Earth. We have a lot of meteorites from Mars. Why? Because Mars has the low escape velocity, and, you know, we collect a lot of them. And only after the Viking mission were they able to figure out that, oh, this has the same isotopic character is what we measured on Mars. These, these are definitely from Mars. It had been a theory, but after Viking, that theory had been substantiated. Now, is this life? President Clinton had a um, big press release on this, and uh, it was presented by NASA as, as being like, the people are divided about this, um, whether it's, it's really life or not. Um, it's very small. It's smaller than things on Earth. Um, I don't know, but if this is what it takes to go back to Mars, I could buy him for this big life. So, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, Mars may have been very Earth-like when life was beginning on Earth, and then there's a question. Uh, is there still water on Mars? Um, very soon, we will, there is a, a European mission, um, and they're going to take two meters, a six-foot core. Whoa. We've only seen, and I didn't have a slide of it, one place on, on Mars where it was an outcrop where they could say, this is an outcrop it's sticking out. O only one place. So we really don't know what's down there. We don't know if there's water down there. I, uh, and it's, I think it's going to bring a seismometer and plant it too. But don't forget, one out of three, one out of three, one out of three missions are successful. So, uh, and the Europeans, when they do a mission, every country in the Union has to participate and make instruments and it's all, it's again, this isn't science, it's politics, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's what it is. So uh, I, I just pray it will be successful and we, we will find out. And maybe, just maybe, there is life still in existence on Mars. Fossils will be a little more difficult to interpret. If, you know, I asked the, the, the woman on the rover team, I said, did you see anything? that looked like, I was afraid to use the word macrofossil, it would be a microfossil, and, and nothing at all, nothing at all. Nothing at all. E evidence of water, but no evidence of life. Okay, so that's Mars, and uh, I'd be glad to entertain any questions that you might have. So volunteers for one way trip to Mars. <laughs> have you have you read about the Mars One project? And so they're looking for people who are interested in going. 
I don't think they used the one way. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned uh, the possibility of putting uh, seismometers, a network of seismometers. How many would you need to make it a useful exercise? Well, you know, I've, I've been saying for years that each mission had been bringing one. Yeah. You know, even you know, even taking the one out of three succeeding, we maybe have ten or twelve. That would be useful. Yeah. Um, it just. Uh, I remember hearing a talk at AGU by uh, his, uh, he's a geochemist from Caltech, and he, he was saying, what we need is a seismometer in our Mars, and I was thinking, this is what it's come to? We have geochemists telling us now we need a seismometer? I, I just can't, under, I just cannot understand it. You know, when, you know, the example, actually, when I was in Beijing, um, I told the students, you know, I was telling them how our admissions are public, there's our, and, you know, anybody can get the data. This is another thing, that the data is available. For a very short length of time, maybe six months or nine months, those people who devoted a decade of their lives to that mission get to look at the data first. It's only fair. Okay. But then it's available for everyone. And so I said to the students there, so even you could go back and look at the lunar seismograms from the 60s and find something new. Well, somebody did that from, from the U.S. Or, or Europe and found did some new analysis and found something interesting about the moon's core. So the point is the data is available to everybody. And in fact, um, my career has pretty much just been working with that data. I haven't produced one piece of data in my life. Uh, but I go back and I look at the data and I, you know, take a look, <coughs> think about a different way. And there's just so much data that I think you could select it at random and come up with something interesting. But the seismometer thing, I think we've come up with first order things, things we don't know anything about. Right now, what they do is they take those meteorites, though they're called um, SNCs, it stands for sugar type, something, Nagati, or, and then some other place, three places on Earth, these, these have appeared, SNCs, and they interpret these meteorites, the people who do the meteorites, and they infer the entire uh, history of Mars' uh, development. I anyway, I, I just cannot buy into that at all. You know, so we have no data, no data about the interior of Mars, and I, I just cannot. How many spectrometers, you know, have we had? A zillion, and no seismometers. So one's a start. One's a start. Right. One's a start. Any other comments or questions? So is it worth the money? That's that's the big question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of money. <laughs> but there's a question. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, since we're sending all these missions to Mars uh, to see if there's life or has been life on Mars, how come we don't um, do any missions plan to Europa or the to moons on Saturn? Where that's our that's outer solar system. Bill, a billion dollars for openers. And, you know, one of the things, you know, I think I forgot to mention, when they sent the Viking, well, okay, when they first went to the moon and the, the uh, astronauts came back, they were quarantined because it was a big concern that they, you know, kind of like, uh, what's that movie? Andromeda Strain, right. The big concern that they could be bringing back something. And when we sent the Vikings, this is our first lander, okay, because up till then everything circled around, so it's, it's okay. Uh, they sterilized them for like a, a very long length of time to not bring something. Um, I think it's, it would be very dangerous to go to Europa or, or Titan at this point in terms of contamination. But I'm not worried about it because it's, it's a billion, a billion for openers. You know, it just isn't going to happen. Titan is the other place um, in our solar system I think that's really promising for life because it's um, exactly at the triple point of methane. And so you get the surface with interaction of solid and liquid and um, gaseous methane, and there's rain, and there's lakes, and there's shores, and there's, it's going to be good. There, the Europa Report, anybody see that? You can watch that. that that's fun. Netflix <laughs> has it. Yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> that's all you get, but it's a really good thing. How is uh, the comparison between Earth and Mars for bombardment like asteroids, and I know Mars being closer to Jupiter? Yeah. 
You mean, is it the same level of? Because you know, one of the one of the things in terms of um, the development of life on Earth and Jupiter and Saturn are huge in keeping our solar system um, a safer place. Because uh, does anybody remember back in the early '90s uh, the Shoemaker Levy impact? Do you remember when that hit Jupiter? I said to myself, "My God, what would have happened if this hit?" Earth? And apparently, if that comet hit Earth, it would have extinguished life down to the microbial level. And it spawned two movies, Deep Impact and Armageddon. Okay? So, um, no, seriously, if we didn't have Jupiter, um, so I, I, you know, if, I would have to guess that with Mars being so close to Jupiter, that Jupiter would, but then it's closer to the asteroid belt. I'm not sure. I don't know. The, there's a lot of doubt about the cratering rate. And the people who study craters have us convinced that they can tell the age of a surface based on the number of craters. Mm -hmm. Maybe. You know, but what else do we have? We have nothing else. 